dog products are ugly. That's it. Pet industry is fun. There's just like a lot of room for growth. You know, it's like the first time in my life where I've ever looked at something and thought, no, I'm, I'm the right person to do this. So we're going to do it. It sold out in four minutes. I was spending a lot of time with my dog and I just kept thinking like, why aren't these things better? We didn't know anything. We just had the gumption, the nerve to think we could do it. I think around 2019, we had something about like 600, 800,000 followers. And we were working with a new manager at the time who said like, what does success look like to you? And I said, well, I'd really like to design a new product. And he said, okay, let's do it. When we think about Little Chunk, this whole company started because I started carrying my dog to and from work as a puppy because I just wanted to bring her everywhere with me. We tried to find a good carrier to bring her on the subway because at the time, this was 2015, dogs had to be in carriers to ride on the New York City subway. And I tried every carrier and they were all built poorly, very thoughtlessly designed. And we started an Instagram as a creative outlet. And I heard from all these people who, like me, wanted a way to carry their dogs because even though we used a backpack, it was it, it kept breaking on us. And I would still like capture Maxi and on my back and the videos would go viral. And people asked us, like, what are you using to carry your dog? I've never seen it before. So I, I couldn't recommend the product because it was, it was it was kind of unsafe. And I, I knew I can do this better. We designed the product and we propped up a brand off of friends and family round of financing and we unleashed it to our audience it sold out in four minutes and you know that was in 2021 three years later now you see people all over the world traveling with their dogs and backpacks but not just that i i think we, we the timing was really interesting because it was we launched it in the middle of the pandemic and the, in the pandemic you saw a really big puppy boom people were at home they were lonely they got dogs or, you know, you saw these people investing more time in their dogs who are either out of work or just like working from home and making content. And then TikTok came and, you know, you would see that content go viral. And people now had the idea that they could make a career out of this. So I think there were just a lot of things that came together to basically just focus on the idea that people love their pets. We had, in the United States, there are more pets than children. So people love their pets. And increasingly, we want to spend more on our pets. We want to do more things with our pets. We, we treat them like members of the family. So I think it's just like a lot of these circumstances came together to really help the thesis that we had. Like I had been doing that since 2015, and now things really started to ramp up. I think the pandemic, for everything awful about it, I think it accelerated a lot of things. And one of those things is just the way we treat our pets. So when I say creating the Nike for the pet industry, we really want to rally this massive community we've built over the past seven years just around the idea that we want to go more places with our pets and we want to set an incredibly high bar for the way that we treat them, the things that we feed them, the bags that we carry them in, the way we take care of them. And historically, challenger brands have been very slow to innovate. We're going to take the torch and run with it. Can you talk a little bit about actually creating the product and how you thought about all the details? We had a really good network. My co-founder had a really good network of people who could, you know, we had a bunch of false starts over the course of a year trying to find a designer, which is like, how do you find a designer? And people were like, oh, go on LinkedIn, which seems like, a, that's, I don't know why that seems stupid. Where do you find like the right people? And so we had a bunch of false starts with a bunch of designers and that was based on no expertise. It's just kind of like a gut thing. We wanted to completely innovate the entire, like the form and the function of this backpack. And I had a laundry list of things that I wanted just after using the product for so long. I wanted, you know, really supportive fabric because I carried a corgi and my audience was corgis. And this is who is at the time mostly using the bag because that's who I would go viral to. And they'd say like, oh, I want to carry my corgi. We all think like, yeah, I'll just fucking put my dog in a bag and bring them with me. You want to keep their back straight. You want to keep their back like really straight on your body. And the products that were out there were just very flimsy. The dog would flop from side to side. The neck wasn't supported. It wasn't weatherproof. My dog doesn't have a tail, but I know that it's important to relieve stress off the tailbone if your dog is upright. And I know that because my dog had surgery when she was younger for bone spurs in her arms, which is a common thing for short-legged dogs. And I wanted the best. So I would seek the best specialist in the world to fix whatever problems I thought came up. And in that process of years and years of surgery and rehab, I would discover things about dogs. And I would talk at length to these specialists because I would just ask them questions when they weren't expecting it. And they would be like, you know what? I don't know why we don't do X, Y, and Z for our dogs because studies show that I would just like learn things that, that didn't really make their way into the consumer market about how we treat our dogs. So, you know, neck support, really structured fabric, 
a tail port to allow their tail out so you're not, they're not sitting on their tail. I really wanted to it to be easy to bring your dog in and out of the bag, which means using modern teaching techniques of about dog training, which is positive reinforcement. So we would teach people to like, you know, open the bag up, put it on the ground, we call it the runway, and you bring a treat and you would just through repetition, teach your dog to walk into the bag so that we can make this as frictionless as possible. Like I would just literally sit up at night thinking about how can we make this easier? How can I take that solution? How can I make that even easier? And just keep chipping away to really try and make this as seamless as possible for pet parents. Because again, I knew this was something people wanted from first party data, from Instagram, thousands of people messaging us, we want this, we want this. And I thought if we could just find a solution, it's like this thing will sell itself. Because if I find something that's unique and not enough people know about it, that's like helping my dog, I'll scream it to people. And other than the, the functionality, I think from a form perspective, dog products are ugly. That's it. None of them look good. I mean, I, I think people have caught on now. I think we're seeing things start to look a little better year by year, quarter by quarter. People are designing like, oh, that, that shit looks cool. Uh, but like none of it looked good. So let's make like a really dope black silhouette. Let's have like some nice orange trim because I like that color. The logo is a peach, which is her butt. Our designer is our co-founder's younger brother, who is just happens to be one of the best graphic designers I've ever worked with in my entire life. They're usually pretty good. And I think other than the product, like also co-founder's girlfriend is another incredible graphic designer. Again, one of the best I've ever worked with. We would give her just some assets and she, she made like a, a like a plain pamphlet with no words to show how to use the product. Like that was just, <clears throat> I think, kind of brilliant just in a way that she created a how-to manual without using a single word, which I think is kind of tough for a dog backpack. And we just had fun with all the stuff that I've thought other pet brands are just like, this is so boring. This is ugly. Like the, from a branding, from a comms perspective, like why are we talking to people this way? I think any category in the pet industry and be like, it, it, it kind of doesn't make sense to me. Like the way we talk about food and supplements, the pet industry is fun because it's, I think there's just a lot of room for growth. And, uh, you know, it's the first time in my life where I've ever looked at something and thought, no, I'm, I'm the right person to do this. So we're going to do it. You mentioned on a previous podcast that in the film industry, they have this question that they ask you, which is something along the lines of why now? And why are you the person to tell this story? And it feels very much like that the right time. And also you are the perfect person to sell this product and also like tell this story. That's a Sundance application. Why you, why are you the person to make this film? Why now? And it's like, when I used to write those, because I would submit films to Sundance, never got in, but we did go to South by Southwest with my feature film, which was, that was a great time. But anyway, I could never truthfully answer that question because it's always like, oh, I want to make movies. I want to do this because it's fun and it's cool. But now there's like a really intense responsibility because why me, why now? Because I have the years of expertise of being a part of this industry, seeing where it's going. And now I it's like incumbent upon me to help push it in the right direction. Nobody else is going to do it the way that we can do it. And nobody's going to give as much of a shit as we're going to give it because I've met a lot of these other founders. And I think there's some people doing great work, but there is, are a lot of people just kind of half-assing their way to building a subpar product and putting a lot of money into a paid marketing spend. And it just kind of drives me up the fucking wall. Yeah, can't imagine anybody else doing it the way we're doing it. Because like even with the Maxine one, we delayed production for six weeks <clears throat> because I wanted a certain kind of buckle that was just hard to get. And everybody's like, no, you can't get the buckle. It's six weeks. You don't want to do it. You're going to miss out on this. I don't care. I will wait to get the best. We'll pay for the best because our pets need it. You mentioned selling out within four minutes. Can you talk a little bit more about how many units that was, what revenue that was? And also it sounds great on the surface, like selling out in four minutes, but can you talk a little bit more about the challenges of building a D2C company too? Even with all of the data that we had of people who wanted this product, we did a limited run. And that's why that's why we sold out because it just kind of really surpassed our expectations. Like we got messages from people around the world that they were waiting up in the middle of the night for this drop because we just kept teasing it out. And it, it, it was crazy. We opened the doors at like 10 a.m. and just watched the inventory drop. And then I <clears throat> immediately had to had to order more, which is. I mean, like, this isn't a cheap product to order. It's not a cheap product to get on the water. Certainly not a cheap product to get on the air. But it, it was really like in, in, in those first four minutes, we knew immediately, okay, we have a viable business. 
let's go and order a lot more products. Because the tough part with all of this is just because you have an audience doesn't mean you can sell a product. And I think that especially now we're seeing a lot of trends, a lot of folks who want to start a business because that's the thing to do right now. And you're seeing a lot of people white label products or, you know, even our 3PL, we've talked to them. And in the time that we've been there since 2021, they've had so many brands come in and go in a span of six months because I think it's really difficult. It's been really difficult to make this transition from a creator to an entrepreneur. And that's fully the track I'm invested in, in, invested in, you know, I'm not the marketing funnel for this company. There's nobody else above me. I am the CEO of this company. It's me and my co-founder and we make every decision. And, you know, it's not like we have a ghost kitchen essentially doing this all for us. What's really difficult about that and something that, that my co-founder always said that I loved and that proved particularly true is launch is overrated. I see it all the time. Launch is overrated. It's the most fun thing in the world. But what's really important after you have a big splashy launch, which I'm sure many creators, most will do because they're great marketers. You know how to tease up something and you know how to serve it up to your audience. But how can you sustain all your comms channels for months and years? Like we've been on a single SKU since 2021 and have done well into the millions of dollars because we've just had a really good idea of what our customer wants and how to give it to them consistently. But also we've held true to a lot of business fundamentals that I think are really being lost because people think that there are still like these these short-term growth hacks to sell a product, which sure, they're, they're just using these short-term growth hacks without really like building a foundation for a sustainable business and investing in like omni-channel communications, trying out stuff that's outside of the box. But also like if you're building a product and it's like a creator-led brand, you have to be so close to that product. Otherwise, you're going to essentially back yourself into a corner selling something you don't really want to be selling or really have the right to be selling. And that can really put you in a pretty dark hole if you don't really believe at the end of the day, this is it. This is the goddamn thing. I will live and die on this hill. I will shout this out every week of my life if I have to. And I firmly believe that the success of this product will lead to the success of the next one. And I want to do another one and another one and another one. So it's tough. I think the creator industry has a steep uphill battle just from at least what I've seen and the way that these deals are going, the way that money is being invested. And then, you know, the longevity or the lack thereof of a lot of these brands. Yeah, that's one thing that I've been noticing in the past couple of years. It's like, everyone focuses on the short term and how can they make as much money as fast as possible. And sometimes that works, but often it has a detrimental impact long term. Like we saw, especially during the pandemic, a lot of these creators launch NFTs and talk. And then now they're all getting sued because they basically just pumped and dumped something that wasn't useful. And we've also seen this across the board with like different sorts of creator brands that were either outsourced or they didn't really care too much about. And so what you guys have been doing is pretty admirable, which is you r deeply care about the product and you know in the long term that this will pan out. And I think that's also something that I'm trying to do more. It's think long term and focus on that because with long term, compounding comes. And if all the results from compounding, you're golden. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit more about learning about the business of building a physical product, figuring out manufacturing, what that looked like? My co-founder is... Maxine's manager. He he DM'd me, slid into my DMs on every platform. And it was like the third message I replied to. I was like, all right, I'll take a meeting. And now he's my co-founder, my best friend, and he's like family. So that's been like, obviously one thing that has been paramount. You know, they say a business partner is like a marriage. It's 100% true. I don't think he and I could be any closer. And it's still tough. It's like, it's really tough running a business. We're very lucky that we're thick as thieves. And, and we think about these things the same way. And we have a really wonderful way that we can communicate. So that's number one. Two, I think people forget that there was, we did a documentary on some Y Combinator companies just after we had graduated, me and a film school friend of mine and something that they had always said that Paul Graham, one of the founders of Y Combinator and like one of the founding fathers of Silicon Valley always said was make something people want. Nobody wants any of that shit. It's like walking into the container store. 
you know, you just kind of buy stuff. When we thought about the dog backpack, did we think about, is this something people really want? Is this something we could really build a business on top of? And of course, the answer ended up being yes. But, you know, it's not just that one product. We're not thinking about this from a product perspective. We're really thinking about it from a brand perspective. It, it starts and ends with a product. You're not going to have a solid brand if you don't have a good product. But <clears throat> when you build these products to us, it's about what the product lets you do. How does it make you feel? And what kind of aspirations can we imbue in this product so that when people buy it, they're they're signing on to hopefully a lot of what we believe, which is like we die for our pets. I was in a very fortunate position to start a company because I had a full-time job and I also had Maxine's account, which we would get brand deals through. So when we started the company, that that safety net was there. Without that safety net, I don't think we would take so she looked at me again. My wife also had a job that paid her a lot of money and, and the health insurance. <laughs> so anyway, had that safety net, which kind of allowed us to, to do what we wanted and approach us the way that we wanted and, and take our time with it, which meant that we had two false starts with other designers. Okay, let's pivot. Let's find somebody else. And if you have like a pretty decent network, we just kind of jumped from one person to the next to get these warm intros, say, hey, do you have anybody who could help do X, Y, and Z? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. We took that meeting and that led to this person, that led to this person. Eventually, we ended up with our first manufacturing partner. So it was a lot of trial and error. And we knew it was going to be trial and error. But I think the important thing to keep in mind is we operate a lot on gut, which has served us really well. But also, if we're stepping through a door and we don't know what's on the other side, we just want to try and mitigate the hard costs as much as possible. Like if we're going to make, if we're about to make a mistake, let's just make sure it's not an expensive one and let's make sure we can adjust pretty quickly. And knock on wood, to date, we've made some, you know, they all not 100% good decisions, but when we step in a wrong direction, it's not a leap. And early on, we signed on Dave Heath as one of our main advisors. Dave Heath is the CEO of Bombas, one of the most profitable D2C brands in the world. Having his ear to kind of help guide us paramount to be able to have him as a sounding board and to help guide us and to, you know, he sends one email and it kind of sets you up with some of the right people because he's made a lot of money. So we were just constantly asking questions and trying to find the right people who can point us in the right direction. Cause I, I, I can't even tell you, like we, when we launched, I thought to myself, like, why don't people just ship around the world? Like, Hey, we'll just do that. Boom. That's knowing what I know now, a truly <laughs> psychotic thought. We wouldn't have, the opportunity like we turn that into a win i'll give you i'll give you that as an example we started shipping around the world and when those orders came to our 3pl they're like hey man what are you what are you doing like we didn't talk about any of this what territories what about duties and technical a million things so we quickly turned it off we took a very modest bath on allowing people to do that without being properly set up walked it back because transparency is everything in how we operate. And I knew we weren't going to lose any goodwill by saying, hey, we messed up. So we turned it off. We told people it's just domestic right now. And then we turned selling around the world as an opportunity to really stoke the flame FOMO and turn that into a little teaser campaign of when we're going to launch around the world and build that up into a little thing. So I think at any opportunity where we've had a minor setback, we took it as an opportunity to have fun with our audience, be upfront. You know, all you can do is say, I'm sorry. And we don't know what we're doing, but I promise you tomorrow we will know what we're doing and we won't make that same mistake twice. And people have been fantastic. They haven't been fantastic around the holiday season when some orders were late, but mostly <laughs> everybody's pretty fantastic. You just got to, you know, the nice thing about running a company and only being two people is you don't have to turn the Titanic. It's like turning a jet ski. You just do it when you want to. You, when you started, most of your sales came from Maxine's accounts across social. Mm -hmm. Now that the business has been going for a while, how much of your sales come from the accounts versus like something else like email marketing or partnership marketing or things like that? Yeah, we diversified pretty quickly because we knew that that was going to be an eventual setback. So we wanted to make sure that we were set up for success and also that we could answer that question. Shortly after launch, well before launch, we had set up, we launched in December 15th, 2021 which was Maxine's sixth birthday, which was really fun. But months prior, we had reached out to the MTA and told them that we are coming out with a carrier that's going to allow people to travel on the subway with their dogs in a backpack. Since January, which was right around the corner, is National Pet Travel Safety Month. We will offer an entire month's worth of content 
infeed stories, takeovers, any kind of branded assets that they might want for their MTA away program, because we knew that they wanted riders back on the train because it was the pandemic and their revenue had plummeted. So they wanted riders back on the train specifically for their away program, which they used to try and show people the fun places around the tri-state area that you can take the train to the MTA, the Metro North, LIR. And they said, okay, what, what do you want in return? And we said, we want ad placement on your digital billboards in every single subway station. And they said, okay, which was probably upwards of a three quarters of a million dollar media buy in exchange for doing what we do best, which is whipping up incredible content. And we had several of those pieces go viral and they were very happy with the relationship. So that's one thing we did to really diversify our reach was, you know, traditional forms of communication, doing a, an entire out-of-home media buy for $0. We also started to build up a really, robust, a really robust newsletter, which every time we would drip that out, that would do really well for us. We bartered creative with, with brands that I met through a founder network group, like just other pet brands who they were doing work that, that we really liked. So I would reach out to the founder and say, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's what you're doing. Here's how we can cross-pollinate and nobody has to spend a dollar. So we did that. We hooked up our friends with products and there were a lot of like, you know, because I've been doing this so long, some of our best friends are some of the biggest pet brands in the world. And, you know, they loved what we were doing. So they kind of helped seed our name out to different places. And what else do we do to get the word out? I mean, TikTok was also like really good for that because TikTok you'll reach. TikTok is weird. Every video that we've had gone viral on TikTok, if you look at the analytics, like how much of that was your audience and how much was just anybody else in the world? And it's usually just anybody else. And then we started to do like a small paid media spend. We had first done most of our first million dollars on a zero dollar CAC. And then once we got up to like one five, we started doing a, a little media spend to try and reach some other customers. Got on Amazon, which has been going gangbusters for us. So yeah. We can get really creative with, you know, reaching new people, which is, yeah, it, it, that, that's a unique challenge for a pet account because, you know, you got one breed and you're serving a lot of one breed. So switching gears a little bit, we've talked a lot about the backpacks, but recently you've signed a book deal with Penguin. Can yep. you talk a bit more about that and why you decided to do that? It was always a dream of, well, first my wife to write a kid's book and I just agree with that dream. But really, it was kind of like her driving that one. So I had mentioned when we had that conversation with our manager and he asked what success looked like, the first thing was the backpack. The second thing was we wanted to write a children's book. We'd always love kids' books. We're big fans of physical media. But I mean, I think kids' books more than anything because we knew we wanted to have a kid and it's just special. The artwork is special. The writing is special. I've always loved Dr. Seuss, Richard Scarry, Oliver Jeffers. Thank you. And just these stories that that people are telling, and, and it was a what we wanted to do was bring Maxine into that very special time between children and their parents before bedtime, and and also like, you know, we think about Maxine not being here a lot, and like, what are we going to leave behind? What is she going to leave behind? My wife was an English major at Barnard. I went to film school, so we thought let's give it a shot. So we put together a manuscript. Our manager got us a literary agent at UTA, and which is crazy that our dog has a literary agent. And we submitted a manuscript. She sent the manuscript out to about 10 publishers. And I think there were only two that replied. And one of them was like the top of the food chain and who we always wanted, which was Penguin Random House. And that started, that whole project started in 2020. And now the book is going to be released on May 5th. And it's like, wow. you know, kind of what we always wanted, a hardcover book. We worked with one of our favorite illustrators and we really bled into this book to try and, write something that not just would be delightful to like our fans and fans of Corgis, but parents who may or may not have a dog, you know? So yeah, that one's really special to us. Yeah. Well, what'd you, what'd you say? Na oh, May 7th. May 7th. Well, yeah. congratulations. Cause you are now parents too. And yeah. uh, I can imagine this makes it extra special for you. You said one thing, which I think I like a lot is you live your life just doing what you want to do. It's like, Yes, you have Little Chunk as a brand and you have all these businesses, but they serve what you want to do and the things that you want to achieve in life. And it's not the other way around, which I think yes. is incredible. It's always been very important to us. You mentioned that because it's the way we always think about almost everything we do. Like, let's just keep doing what we want to do. And how can we use these wonderful opportunities 
to which we've been afforded to just continue doing the shit we want to do, which is always really simple. It's be creative, hang out with our animals, and just try and live a fun, normal life. And to close off with, what do you want to do next? I know parenthood has just started, so obviously there's that. But besides that, is there anything else that you see in the horizon? I probably should be used to answering this question, but it's like, you know, listen, at the end of the day, what do I see next is building this company up to 100 to $300 million. That's really the goal, is to really become a serious player. We've thrown out the first pitch at like a Mets game. We've been able to wander the Met on a day it was closed. We've met Ed Sheeran. This dog was on the back of Burt Kreischer. She went rock climbing with Jared Leto. You know, it's just like, how much is enough? You know, like, it's a nice place to just be kind of like content, but never satisfied. So when you say like, what more do you want to do? Like, I don't know, have like an entire cruise ship. to You know, it's just like social media has gotten things out of control with if you have the right following, the kind of shit you can get. Uh, it, it truly is out of control. Like there's this app now where you can just sign up for it if you're a creator with a certain following. And then you can just look up hotels, cruises, experiences to just do for free in exchange for a post, which is like bonkers to me. So I don't know. That's a tough question. Maybe Maxine gets her own Lego. It's yeah, you know, that, I mean, like how, it's like there's no limit and it's fun and weird. There's not much I want. Maybe like a $500 million exit. That's a great ending. Where can people <laughs> find you online? You can find us at Mad Max underscore Fluffy Road on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, not on Snapchat. 